everyone, and welcome to another episode of a Horizon Series Interviews. My name is Helen Belay. I'm one of the artists, um, associate artists at the Citadel, and I am super excited to get to interview Cheryl Fogo today. But before we start, I would like to acknowledge the land that we gather on is Treaty Number no. 6 territory, a traditional meeting ground and home of the First Nations, including both treaty signatories, the Cree, Soto, Nakota Sioux, Stony, and Cree Iroquois as well as other Indigenous peoples, such as the Blackfoot and Métis, who occupied this land. We extend our appreciation for the opportunity to live, create, and perform on this territory. So, Cheryl, would you like to introduce yourself and talk a little bit more about what you do? Oh, sure. Well, first of all, hello, Helen. <laughs> uh, great to chat with you today, and hello, everyone else out there listening and watching. Um, yes, my name is Cheryl Fogo. I am an author, playwright, uh, filmmaker, and historian who uh, write, I write and, and tell stories and create, um, for the most part, around the history and living history, uh, the, the, the past, the present, and the future of people of African descent who have been living here in Western Canada for the last 120, 130 years or so. Thank you. So what inspired you to get into playwriting specifically? Did you have a significant moment or was it a slow awakening? I had a significant moment. Yes, I had been doing a lot of different kinds of writing because for me, it's um, my writing and my creative output is about the story I want to tell, which is the story of people of African descent here in Western Canada. And I wanted to tell that story to a lot of different audiences. I wanted to speak to as many people as I could. So that's why I, I've written books and kids books and I've done tons of journalism and nonfiction. My first book was a nonfiction memoir, or, you know, kind of the story of my family and how we came to be here um, since the time that my both sets of my maternal great grandparents came in 1910. And I hadn't, um, I hadn't attempted writing for the theater as a professional because I am married to a playwright. And from the outside looking in, I thought that looked like a really difficult um, endeavor for a lot of different reasons, just playwriting and theater looked like um, something that was, you had to have such a specific set of skills for, and it's so community based. And I had already experienced uh, a lack of support for telling the stories that I wanted to tell here in Western Canada. I also could see that that was happening in theater. I, I, like I say, I was, I was married to a playwright. I went to lots of theater I didn't see very much theater that reflected the black experience. I didn't see a lot of black people on the stages. So I thought that's something that's not for me. Um, and then one day, Joanne DeLeo, who is a theater person here in Calgary, well known, has done a lot of things, was the artistic director of Lunchbox Theater at that time. And she just, called and asked me if I would be interested in trying to write something for their, they had a, a, a kind of a development series for one act plays for their stage. And I had in that year, mm -hmm. I had recognized that I was starting to say no to a lot of things because I had established myself as a writer. I was afraid to risk what success I had found, you know, in, when I say success, I, I was starting to get a foothold in and to be published. And I was afraid and I was starting to say no to a lot of things that caused me fear. So my New Year's resolution that year had been to say yes to every professional opportunity that came my way. So I always keep promises to myself. And so when Joanne happened to make that request in that particular year, I had to say yes. Um, it's a very long answer, but it was a very specific moment that that brought me to writing for the theater. Hmm. Thank you. Long answer, but great answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
so in terms of your work, what's likely most recent in the memory of Edmonton audiences is Workshop West's production of your play, John Ware Reimagined. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to what, it, what inspired that as well as your other work that weaves together the often uh, untold and unknown history of Black Albertans? Yes, I had been interested in the life and legacy of John Ware, who, for those who don't know, was a black cowboy who came to what was then known as the Northwest Territories, but later became Alberta. Uh, he arrived in 1882 and became a very successful cowboy first and then rancher and just an all around very successful human being. Uh, he died in 1905, so many, many decades before I was born. But I grew up in a city that was obsessed with cowboys, and I, like lots of little kids, was really into that, <laughs> into that mythology. My, my brother and myself played cowboys all the time. Um, John Ware, the discovery of the existence of John Ware was very important to my being able to accept and marry and be comfortable within all my different identities. My identity as a person of African heritage and my identity as a Calgarian, as a person from this part of the world. Um, my, as I said, my great grandparents came to this part of the world. My grandparents spent most of their lives here. My mother, you know, for many generations back, this was our home. And yet <clears throat> I hadn't really felt totally comfortable with that sort of um, cowboy culture and heritage as I got older. As a young person, I was very comfortable with it. As I got older, I again, it was just that we were not there. I did not see us there until um, we discovered the existence of John Ware. So he was important to me personally from quite an early age. I started gathering information about him in my early 20s. And then in 2012, Calgary was celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Stampede and Tunde Duwadu, who was at that time the artistic director of the Africa Day Festival said, you know, really we, we should probably do something to make sure John Ware is not forgotten in all of this hoopla. John Ware did not live to see the Stampede happen. He died in 1905, the Stampede started in 1912. But he was very integral to all of those values that create that led to the creation of it. He was very close friends with three of the four men who financed the very first stampede. So I started working on a presentation that um, I could, you know, present for Black History Month and whatnot about his life. I wasn't thinking of it as a play at that time. I was in it. I, I had slides and I talked about his life and it was a presentation. I happened to hire a couple of actors because I wanted John and Mildred to be in the presentation. So, so Jesse Lipscomb and Janelle Cooper played John and Mildred Ware in that piece. And I also asked my daughter, Miranda, who was at that time a student at UBC and one of her she was part of her degree was in creative writing and part of that creative writing degree was in songwriting. She, you know, she's a wonderful songwriter and singer. Um, I asked Miranda to write a couple of songs. So that's what it was in 2012. It was a presentation and I stood there and talked and John and Mildred did a couple of scenes and Miranda sang some songs and the response to it was so warm that uh, a lot of people asked me if I could expand it. Would I? They wanted to see more. They wanted to spend more time with John and Mildred. So again, um, writing it as a play was a result of recognizing the need for that story, recognizing that um, Black people specifically, especially young Black people, responded to seeing these people that they had never heard of that really were very important to Alberta history and Canadian history. Um, and young, young Black people who worked in theatre wanted to see those kinds of stories. So again, writing it as a play was a response to seeing that there's a need for our stories to be told on our stages. Thank you. So 
this is building a bit more on what you closed that question with. Why do you find it important and or inspiring to dust off these stories and breathe life to them during the now? I think something that's often discussed when we touch on um, historical narratives is why this, why now? So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, because we are, as James Baldwin said, we are 100% our past. And I chose to tell the story of John and Mildred in a kind of a magical way, in that way that you can do in theater that you, that is much harder to do anywhere else. Um, I chose to set the story both in the past and in the present and in an imagined future. So I, there's a character based on me that's in the play and it was also a way to allow me to explore a world where I knew them, where I spoke to them, where they spoke to me, where John Ware was in my classroom at school and I was in their cabin when, um, when their baby was sick. And um, we, we often think of history and the stories that happened in the past as something that has no relevance to our lives today, but it has tremendous relevance. And in the case of John Ware Reimagined, what I wanted is for the audience to see that there in front of me is a living, breathing human being who is telling the story of her own life. And the beginning of the play is always set today. I didn't write it so that it was set in 2014 when we first produced it here in Calgary. I set it so that it's always today. And it helps people to understand that because John Ware and his life had such a, a profound impact on the life of a person that's standing in front of them right there and right now, we see that there is a, there is a connection between our past and our present and our future. We are terrible in Canada at telling our, our stories. We are terrible at acknowledging our history. There are so few Albertans who know about the deep, rich black history of this province and that is a tragedy for all of us not just black people it's in particular a tragedy for black people mm -hmm. uh, who are constantly having to justify our presence here we're yeah. constantly being greeted as though we arrived yesterday and don't get me wrong there's nothing there's there's no difference in the value of my life um from the value of the life of someone who did arrive yesterday. It's just that I didn't arrive yesterday. My great grandparents helped to create the society that we're living in. So our, our past is important and relevant and absolutely has impact on the lives of who we are today. So that's why I think it is important to tell historical narratives. They're just so absent. They're so absent from our, provincial, from our civic, and from our national narratives. Thank you. You're absolutely right. Um, so what are your dreams for the future, both in our craft and in general? Like I highly uh, encourage you to name the most wild, but the realistic and mundane also have their value. So if you want to talk about that, go for it. I have seen so much black excellence in Alberta in the theater. And what I would like to see is for Alberta, you know, Calgary, maybe specifically, you can come down and join us. <laughs> um, I would like this to become a center of black excellence for theater. I would like for the work that's being done here by the young playwrights that are, are coming along like Makambe Samamba and um, uh, Rebecca Kummer and oh, there, there are just so many, you know, Melanie Murray Hunt is, she's younger than me, but she's not as young as some of those others. There are so many playwrights here writing amazing work there are also so many actors who move me so deeply when I see them getting a chance to shine, mm -hmm. getting a chance to practice their craft, 
Janelle Cooper and I, Janelle, who I mentioned earlier, who acted and, and originated the role of Mildred, that was also played so beautifully by um, Jamila McNeil up in Edmonton in the, in the production there. Um, Janelle and I co-produced Alberta's first Black Canadian theater series in 2014-15. We produced three plays by Black Canadian playwrights, one of which was John Ware Reimagined. And to see that year of young Black actors being able to just work for a whole year, being able to practice their craft. You get better as an actor when you get the chance to work all the time, when you get to work with different directors. You cannot become and, and improve your, your artistic practice in any endeavor if you're not doing it. Seeing how people blossomed over that year was astonishing. And that is what I would like to see. I would like to see a future where that's not a one-time thing, where, where Black actors, stage managers, directors, playwrights, makeup artists, set designers are, are working together and becoming a force that's reckoned with in the rest of the world because I know the quality of the work is there. I am not uh, exaggerating in terms of the talent pool that is here. It just breaks my heart that people keep having to go away to do their work in the theater. I have lost, I have watched generations of, of very talented young black people move away from here and that's devastating. I would like that to stop happening. So that is my that is, you know, that is my dream, but it's not a wild, it is not a wild and unachievable dream. It is something that could happen. Yeah. And hopefully it'll be sooner rather than later. Um, so what's been bringing you joy and or inspiration at this point in time where that can kind of be hard to find? Mm -hmm. My family, of course, I, uh, I'm very blessed to have a wonderful family. My, my partner, Clem Martini, as I mentioned, is also a playwright and a writer. We, we love sharing our creative process. We're, we're, we're so joyful in that, in talking mm -hmm. about our work. Um, and our two daughters, Chandra and Miranda, and my grandson, Julian, those are the key elements of my joy. Uh, I'm also very close to you know, my siblings and my nieces and nephews and, and their, um, their children. So I'm a, I'm called Granty, you know, combination <laughs> of great aunt. I, I'm, I'm Granty and uh, I love all those roles and I find a lot of joy in that. I also find a lot of joy in dipping into other people's creative output. Music is very grounding for me. I'm grateful every single day of my life for musicians, for people who have persevered, who've gone into the studio and made music. That absolutely is like drinking water for me. It's like eating food. It is, it is a necessary element of my life. Reading books, I've just derived so much joy from, uh, recently I, I read and discussed online a book called Pow Wow. I, I have it here. Um, Pow Wow, A Celebration Through Song and Dance. I Reading that book was so enlightening, enriching. And, um, you know, if I could do my own little land acknowledgement now, just um, it helps, helped me to further deepen the connections I already have with my Indigenous brothers and sisters and cousins who who live and work and, and again are living people. I'm not acknowledging a past. I am, I'm not acknowledging a past only um, that, that, that lived for 10,000 years before we came here. I'm also acknowledging a present and a future together. Uh, so literature, um, the, the arts, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Where would we be without the arts? Um, taking walks, you know, uh, mucking around in my garden. There are a thousand sources of joy for me, and I feel very blessed about that. 
these are hard times. These are these. This is a hard moment that we're in, and uh, I I'm not wanting to minimize that I experience a lot of grief over the um, the brutality that Black people live with on a regular basis. I acknowledge that. I also find it very important to seek out those sources of joy, as you say. Mm -hmm. Totally. Well, thank you so much. I, that's, that's time. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. Is there anything you'd like to plug or should we just wrap it up? Uh, well, I have a film. I, I have a documentary film that I've been working on for about f five years called John Ware Reclaimed. Ah. One of, yeah, it's uh, part of a, a trilogy. So John Ware Reimagined, the play was the first. John Ware Reclaimed is launching later this summer or early fall. And uh, I also plan to write a book uh, that will be John Ware Re-something. I don't know what yet. So I, I'm getting to continue my, my work with John Ware. Um, no, beyond that, uh, I don't have anything to plug. I just want to say thank you. And I look forward to learning more from you and about your work, Helen. I hope we get a chance to work together at some point in the future. And I just want to say to, uh, to all the um, theater artists, young black theater artists who might be watching today, that I wish you all well. I am on your side. I'm on your team. And if ever there's anything I can do to help and support, please reach out. Thank you so much. That means so much to me. And I'm sure it will mean so much to each and every person who you just talked to. It, you can feel so alone sometimes here in Alberta, frankly. So thank you. Well, <laughs> well it was a pleasure chatting. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Um, and stay well, stay kind, and look for joy when you can. <laughs> <laughs>